Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Again, my name is Steve Schwinn. I teach constitutional law at the University of Illinois Chicago Law School. I am thrilled and delighted to be with you today to talk about the issues coming out of the election and the insurrection and today's impeachment and the news just keeps coming, doesn't it? So all of this stuff is on the table to talk about today. I want to start by thanking Dean Dickerson and uh, Michael Huggins and Miller McDonald, uh, who have been instrumental in putting this together. I can't say enough how much I appreciate the support of the administration in running programs like this. And I can't say enough how much I appreciate the assistance of uh, Michael Huggins and Miller McDonald in conducting this program, publicizing it, and making sure that we get good attendance and have a good conversation. So thank you all my deepest gratitude. I appreciate that. What I'd like to do today is have a conversation, a real discussion if we can, about the recent issues in the news. And, and when I say discussion, I truly, truly mean that. We've had these video forums before. They often turn into a Q&A or a talking head, which I think is fine. There's a time and place for that. But I really would like to have a conversation with you today and hear what you have to say about the recent events, in particular in light of constitutional issues and the recent events. So what I propose to do is spend a couple of minutes breaking down what's gone on in the last couple of months and then focusing more particularly what's gone on in the last week or so and what might happen going forward, just so that we're all kind of on the same page. I understand that many of us may not have been following the news as closely as others, and, um, and as I set out this timeline, I'd also like to flag some constitutional issues and some really, really important to open questions that I think we have an opportunity to discuss and talk about in, uh, in a normative kind of way during this conversation. And it's really that that I'd like to focus on today. And so I, I invite you to join me in this discussion and, and this endeavor. And what I'd really, really like to do is begin a community conversation about how we can think about some of these unanswered questions that have come up in the context of the election, the insurrection, the impeachment and beyond, and think as a community, what can we do about this? How can we make this constitution our own in terms of understanding and interpreting it and going forward and taking action to, uh, to take ownership over it? So if it's okay with you, that's what I'd like to do, but that's of course gonna depend on your participation. And so I hope you feel free to participate. Given the numbers, I think the best way to do this would be to drop a note in chat, either to the group or to Miller, if you'd have something to say and we can, you can unmute and then say it. Um, or alternatively, if you'd like to remain anonymous or put your question just in, in word form, go ahead and drop it in chat or drop it in chat to, uh, to Miller individually, and we'll come around to your questions and comments as we go. So with that, I'm gonna pause for a second and uh, have me a quick sip of coffee here and see if there are any questions or any strong objections to, uh, to my proposed approach. Okay, awesome, thank you. And again, I just, I do wanna thank everybody for participating today. This is a real pleasure and treat for me and I think a real service to, uh, to the community and, and to the larger conversation that we're having about the constitution. So let's rewind here a second and take a kind of 30,000 foot view of what's been going on over the last month or so and, uh, and try to understand where some of the flashpoints, where some of the indeterminacies, where are some of the questions that need to be answered as a matter of constitutional law, public policy, and politics, and see what we can't make of those. I think kind of along the way, we can sketch out an agenda for today's discussion, although I want to be clear that if you have any questions or concerns that we don't raise as I go through this, please, please feel free to share them as, uh, as we go. We've got a full uh, hour and a half, um, so plenty of time to have a, a, a good and rich conversation. We started all this with the election. Remember that? Um, it seems like ages ago, doesn't it? The election, right? Was that just last year? Yeah, just a couple of months ago, amazingly. And so we had this election for the president. And as we know, 
when we go to elect the president, we're not actually electing the president directly. What we're doing is electing electors who then in turn elect the president through the electoral college. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But it's important to understand that the vote that we're casting, while it looks like it's for the president and vice president, it's actually for a slate of electors that our state legislature has designated to represent our vote for the slate ticket that we voted for. Now that's important because as the electoral returns came in, state election officials, state secretaries of state and state governors started certifying these election returns and ascertaining the slate of electors that represented the majority vote in our state. As they did that, of course, we remember there was just a ton of litigation in this election, right? Just, just a ton of litigation, not only in the, uh, the states that we heard about, but a lot of litigation in the states that we didn't hear about. Most of this litigation, in fact, the vast majority, in fact, all of it, quite frankly, we're talking about scores of cases, some 65 plus, were dismissed. Um, and the, uh, the challengers to the election results lost those cases either on the merits or on procedural grounds. And if you're interested, we can talk a little bit more about that. But, um, but we've obviously now moved beyond those cases. And the Supreme Court just this past war week has put a kind of exclamation point behind those losses in saying that it's really not going to hear any other election cases arising out of the 2020 election. So we had a number of cases and a number of challenges. The courts rebuffed those challenges. State election officials ascertained the vote and ascertained the electoral slate that would represent the majority in each state. And in doing so, they ascertained and determined who the electors were going to be to represent their state in the electoral college. They certified their, their, their slate of electors. They forwarded that slate on to Washington. The electors met and they cast their votes in the electoral college. Now, at this point, we saw a really interesting thing happen in a couple of the so-called battleground states. What we saw happen is not only the officially ascertained electors meet and vote for the designated candidates, in, in these cases, it was Biden and Harris, but we also saw electors meet under the auspices of, uh, of, of claiming to represent a vote in favor of President Trump and Vice President Pence. And we saw this in, uh, in Arizona, we saw it in Michigan, we saw it in Wisconsin in particular, where Republicans electors who would have been the state's electors had President Trump won the majority vote in those states, those electors got together in, informally. They claimed it was formally, but they really got together informally and cast their vote. Now that was important because what they were trying to do is set up a competing slate of electors coming from those battleground states that they then would certify to Washington for the electoral vote that occurred last week, putting Congress in a position where it was faced with competing slates of electors from a state, a slate of electors for Harris and Biden, for example, from Arizona, but also a competing slate of electors for Trump and Pence from that same state. Now that gambit failed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that failing as we move on, but it's important to understand that Republican electors put their heads together informally to cast a vote in order to set up this idea of competing slates of electors from those states and put Congress in a kind of bind that ultimately did not transpire, but could have led to a, uh, a congressional showdown over which slate of electors to, uh, to recognize. So we know that the Electoral College met, it voted, it certified its votes for Biden and Harris, and those votes went on to Congress. Now, at this point, we ordinarily don't pay attention to any of this in an ordinary presidential election, but this election was anything but ordinary. So we were paying careful and keen attention to this. And we saw President Trump making a lot of noise through, uh, through November and December trying to influence members of Congress and the vice president to, to discard ascertained slates of electors, officially ascertained slates of electors from key battleground states so that the electoral college vote would go to President Trump. Now there are some mechanics involved in the way that Congress counts votes. And if you've been following the news closely, you probably are aware of at least some of these. 
But what happens is if, uh, if a member of Congress, both a member of the House and a member of the Senate come together and they lodge an objection to a state's slate of electors, then the House and the Senate would meet separately for two hours. They would take a vote separately by majority vote. They could rule that a state's slate of electors was invalid. Now, we predicted that that wasn't going to happen given that Democrats controlled the House. Even if Republicans in the Senate were to vote that way, they would have been checked by Democrats in the House. But still, this was yet another opportunity for Republicans to challenge the state's electors, to delay the vote in the Electoral College, and to confuse the vote in the Electoral College. We didn't get there because when Congress convened to, uh, to count the votes, as we all know at this point, there was an insurrection. They interfered the counting, with the counting of the votes. Now, there were some objections to the counts, and the houses did actually separate for some time to, uh, to vote on those objections. But ultimately, the insurrection, as we know, was unsuccessful. Um, in the wake of that, there was a lot of talk about invocation of the 25th Amendment. There was a lot of talk about invocation of the tool of, um, of impeachment. And there's talk about the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Again, if we've been following the news, you're familiar with these, but I'll review them really quickly and try to identify some of the indeterminate points under constitutional law that might be interesting to talk about. And uh, certainly, I'm interested in your reaction on them. So let's take those one at a time. 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment, we know, is a device by which the vice president can get together with a majority member, majority of the members in the president's cabinet and essentially oust the president if there's an incapacity in the president. So this was designed in the wake of JFK's assassination to ensure that we had a line of secession to the presidency and that somebody could step in if the president became unable to fulfill the duties of the presidency. Now, when uh, there are claims that President Trump cannot fulfill the duties of the presidency, that really, in, to some, pushes the boundaries of the 25th Amendment. Some have claimed that the 25th Amendment really isn't designed for this kind of thing. It's really designed for a physical incapacity, for example, where a president physically is unable to do the job of the presidency. And by this reckoning, what some of the folks were saying is, look, the objection here isn't that President Trump can't do the job of the presidency. It's actually the opposite. It's that he's doing too much of the job of the presidency. And so the 25th Amendment just doesn't really apply. And ultimately, that was the position that Vice President Pence took when he sent a letter just late last night to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declining to invoke the 25th Amendment and saying, as a constitutional matter, it's just a bad fit here. So President, or I'm sorry, Vice President Pence didn't even start the ball rolling on the 25th Amendment. But had he, he and a majority member of the cabinet could have voted together to take President Trump out of office of the presidency. At that point, Vice President Pence would become acting president President Trump would have an opportunity to object to that to Congress. Congress then would have a chance to rule on President Trump's objection. And given the timing here, if this all would have played out because we're so close to the end of President Trump's term, as a matter of fact, President, Vice President Pence and a majority of the cabinet could have in effect ousted President Trump for the remainder of his term. We can delve deeper into that if you're interested, but the, interest, the thing that, that really captured my attention about the whole 25th Amendment debate is, is it applicable? Is it the kind of thing that we ought to use in a sense? And I hope that that'll be a point of, of discussion and debate that we can have as we go forward. So that's 25th Amendment. Next, we heard talk about impeachment. Now we know about impeachment all too well, right? President Trump was just impeached a year ago after all for entirely different things. And now the House is moving to impeach him and indeed voted him yet again for this next act. So let me say a couple of words about impeachment. We know that impeachment is actually a two-step process and it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a misnomer, a bit of a fake out term when we just talk about impeachment because it's actually two things. It's impeachment in the House of Representatives, which is a little like a criminal indictment, but I wanna be clear, impeachment is not a criminal process. 
So indictment or impeachment in the House of Representatives by a majority vote, and in this case, the House voted by a majority to adopt the article of impeachment for incitement to insurrection. We've talked a little bit more about what that means, another point of uh, interesting point of constitutional law, and some have claimed of free speech. So let's hold on to that and think about that as an agenda item. Um, the House voted to uh, in favor of that, and they voted by majority, but that doesn't do anything to President Trump. The Senate is step two. The Senate needs to convict and needs to convict by a two thirds majority in order to re remove President Trump from office. It doesn't look like the Senate's going to be able to take that up, or at least Senator McConnell is not going to get the Senate back together in session to take that up before Trump leaves office. So I'm a little dubious about the ability of the Senate to put together a two thirds vote to remove President Trump from office before he leaves because his term ends. But there is another thing that Congress can do with impeachment. Congress can actually designate the president as disqualified for running for future office as part of the impeachment process. Impeachment allows for that. Congress could vote and by prior congressional practice, this only requires a majority vote in both chambers, not a two thirds vote in the Senate, but just a majority vote in two chambers to designate President Trump as uh, unqualified for future office in the future. Now, the impeachment mechanism raises all kinds of interesting questions, right? Given the point in President Trump's term, one of the questions is, should we even be considering impeachment? Does it even make sense at this point? Both politically and constitutionally, does it make sense? And a number of folks have raised that question. I think it's an interesting one that we can certainly talk about. Um, another related question, if impeachment if the trial can't occur in the Senate before the end of President Trump's term, can Congress nevertheless move forward with impeachment after President Trump leaves office? Now, historical precedent says, yes, Congress can do that. And I can tell you a little bit more about that if you're interested. But there have been some serious questions about whether President Trump can be impeached after he leaves office or whether anybody could be impeached after they leave office. Indeed, former, uh, a former judge on the Fourth Circuit, uh, Michael Ludig, wrote recently in the Washington Post that impeachment after one leaves office is just not a thing. Um, a lot of constitutional thinkers, myself included, disagree with that vehemently, but I do think it's a point for, uh, for discussion. And then finally, there are all the politics and impeachment that I think we can talk about and, and are really, you know, just offer a lot of fodder for discussion. Finally, the one that we might not have heard so much about is 14th Amendment Section 3. The 14th Amendment, as we know, was adopted in the wake of the Civil War and the Reconstruction period. And the idea behind Section 3 was to allow Congress to designate certain individuals who were involved in the insurrection uh, that was the the uh, that was that gave rise to the Civil War. That was the the um, the South uh, would prevent them from holding federal office or state office under Fourteenth Amendment Section Three. What the provision says is that anybody who is involved in an insurrection is disqualified from holding federal or state office. Federal uh, this includes the presidency, the vice presidency members of Congress, federal judiciary, state offices, it, it, anything, you are disqualified. And so the thinking behind this is that Congress, again, by a majority vote in both chambers, could designate President Trump as having been involved in this insurrection and therefore disqualified from holding office in the future, either at the federal level or the state level. And indeed, the articles of impeachment that Congressman Raskin introduced and was passed by the House today included reference to the 14th Amendment, Section 3. And there are some interesting reasons why Congress might have done that, that I think we can talk about as well. Finally, just as a matter of introduction, and I know I'm blabbing on, I'm really sorry about that, but I want to kind of lay it all out there. The final thing that folks have been talking about is the president's pardon power, right? The president has the power of pardon, but it's important to understand the meets and bounds of that power. The president can pardon individuals for federal crimes, which include crimes in the District of Columbia for reasons that we can discuss if you're interested. The president can pardon people 
for actions that would lead to federal crimes, but the president cannot pardon anybody for impeachment. The pardon power just doesn't extend to impeachment. So we've been hearing some talk in recent days, for example, about a self-pardon by President Trump. Well, the pardon power doesn't extend to impeachment, and so that wouldn't work for President Trump's impeachment anyway. It probably wouldn't work for, uh, for 14th Amendment Section 3 purposes. And the whole idea of a self-pardon is something that's hotly controversial. The Justice Department has long held that self-pardon isn't a thing under our Constitution and that one cannot self-pardon oneself. Another point that is, that's unsettled under constitutional law that I thought would be interesting to talk about today, and that is the self-pardon. Outside of President Trump pardoning himself, he could certainly pardon members of his administration, members of his family who are serving in his administration um, and who are not serving in his administration. And we've seen President Trump already exercise the pardon power pretty aggressively with some close allies in, uh, in recent weeks and months. Um, many have asked me, could he pardon the insurrectionists at the, camp, at the Capitol? The answer is absolutely yes, he could. But again, he could only pardon them for state, for federal crimes or crimes that were committed under DC law. He could not pardon them for inchoate crimes, crimes of attempt or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or try, crimes moving in the direction of the insurrection that were committed largely in the states. And incidentally, he can't, he can't pardon himself, even if he could pardon himself. He can't pardon himself for potential state crimes that he might be charged with in New York and Georgia um, arising out of uh, different events. So I think with that, what I'm going to do is just stop, um, because if you're not tired of hearing me, hearing me talk, I'm certainly tired of hearing me talk. And what I'd like to do is just kind of open this up and see what you all want to talk about. So I, I, I see that there's some activity in chat. And Miller, you may have some other things going on. Do you see anything that we ought to be talking about? Yes, Steve. So we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first two I think together um, and they came in early on so you have touched base on them but I still want to ask them so Laura Darby had asked what's the process for denying Mr. Trump the benefits of former presidents and denying him the right to run for office again and then Stephanie Glassberg had asked can Trump be impeached confirmed by the Senate after his term is over and Biden takes office which I know you touched on but she also wanted to know if yeah. there's any law on this. Um, so we have a few other questions, but I think those two are good to start with. Yes, so a lot of folks have asked, and I, I, you know, I'm interested in what in you're all thinking about this. A lot of folks have asked, does it make sense if um, if Congress were to remove President Trump one way or another? Does it make sense that he would continue to get his $200,000 a year pension from the federal government, his travel allowance from the federal government, and his security detail from the federal government? And it turns out there's federal law on this. If a president leaves office um, by means other than impeachment, then the president is entitled to those things. And so if the Congress doesn't remove the president by impeachment um, before the end of the president's term, then yes, the president by statutory law would be entitled to the pension and the travel allowance that's accorded to presidents and presumably the office as well. Um, the security detail is a somewhat different thing. The security detail will follow the president under a different law um, as long as it's reasonable um, when the president leaves office one way or the other. Now, the reason that I emphasize statutory law and the answer to both of these questions is because Congress can change this, right? If Congress determines that President Trump, for whatever reason, isn't entitled, or any former president, isn't entitled to these benefits, Congress can rewrite the law and change the law. And, uh, and with President Biden coming into office, Democrats coming into control in the Senate, uh, there are at least the, vote, the, at least the theoretical possibility of the votes lining up to allow that to happen. Um, whether Congress and President Biden would actually do that, I think is a different question entirely, but they certainly could. Um, the other, the other question, is there any law on uh, impeaching post office? So the, here, here's an interesting thing about constitutional law. 
we have the constitutional text itself, right? And that gives us some law, but our own constitution is famously old and it's famously short. Um, and it doesn't answer a lot of questions that we have. In fact, many of the questions that I raised today are utterly unanswered by the constitution, or if they're even addressed by the constitution, they're answered in vague and ambiguous ways. So what else do we look to? Well, we look to Supreme Court precedent, right? When the Supreme Court has ruled on particular issues. As it turns out, the Supreme Court has ruled on relatively few of the issues that we've discussed. And the reason why is because the courts have, as a general matter said, these are really non-justiciable questions. They're really outside the expertise of judges. They really belong in the political branches the presidency and Congress. And so the courts have largely declined to rule on many of these questions. And so we really have a lot of open questions in the timeline that I went through and the agenda that I set out. Um, so is there anything else that we can look to in terms of law in understanding the way the constitution ought to work here? And the answer is yes, there is. In our constitutional tradition, it's a kind of it's almost a kind of common law tradition in practice, right? We look to history and practice as guidance for what we can do in the future. And what I tell my students is what, for example, a president has done in the past without significant pushback from Congress or the courts. What a president has done in the past is pretty good indication of what a president can do today and in the future. And that principle applies to Congress and the courts as well. So we have seen Congress twice in our history start impeachment proceedings against officials who were out of office. In 1797, if you can imagine that, Congress started impeachment proceedings against a, a United States Senator that Congress had previously expelled from the Senate, Senator Blount, B-L-O-U-N-T, if you're interested in the history here. And then later in the late 19th century, Congress started impeachment proceedings against um, President Grant's Secretary of War after he had left office. And so there are two precedents for doing this. Now, when I mentioned earlier that Judge Ludig had penned this editorial saying that, no, you can't do that. You can't do impeachment post office. What he's relying on is largely just the text of the Constitution. The text of the Constitution says that Congress can impeach officers, right? And he's saying that means Congress can only impeach officers. But what some have argued in response to that is that it really makes no sense. What it means is that a president, for example, could avoid impeachment altogether by committing an impeachable offense today and resigning tomorrow morning, right? And, uh, and that makes no sense. And moreover, a president could avoid removal, uh, I'm sorry, disqualification from future office. Remember that second effect of impeachment, um, so long as they could run the clock and, uh, and keep impeachment proceedings from beginning until after their office is terminated. And that makes no sense either. So there's a little back and forth about this, but I, I, it's, it, it's an open question as far as the courts are concerned. We don't have a judicial ruling on it. And I'd really love to hear your thoughts on those questions. I think they're, they're really hard ones and they're out there right in the public right now. Okay, so um, another question that has come in is that supposedly some Republicans were afraid to vote for impeachment today. Why are the votes public? Could, um, couldn't they be done in secret? Ah, interesting question. No, you know, our tradition in uh, voting, we have a tradition of voting in secret when we go to the polls individually, but Congress, congressional votes are public. We need to know the way our public officials are voting so that we can hold them to account in a democracy. If we don't know the way that they're voting, um, you know, we, we can't vote them out if we dislike the way that they're voting. The fact that they're being threatened physically, I think raises a host of other problems um, and, uh, and certainly is not, uh, <laughs> you know, is not indicative of a healthy running democracy, but, um, but requiring, uh, allowing them to conceal their votes would, could be equally prom problematic for other democratic reasons. Um, just as we're going through this, you know, I, 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 I'm really truly interested in your thoughts on this. And so what I'm going to ask is if you would like to weigh in on any of these questions in a pine, um, raise your electronic hand or ping me or Miller uh, or Michael or, or, or all of us for that matter, 
and let us know that you want to speak up. I, I truly would love to hear from you. Um, another question, we actually had two questions come in that kind of um, work together, but so in terms of running for future office, um, would that be just for the presidency or does that mean to hold any political position? And then along those same lines, is it just running for elected office that would be barred or would it also bar appointment to something like a public position? Yeah, great questions. So it would apply to uh, all elected offices um, under the 14th Amendment Section 3 and potentially to appointed offices as well. Now, 14th Amendment Section 3 is, uh, is a different uh, procedure and may require a different vote on the part of Congress, indicating clearly what they're doing. What they'd be saying is we're designating a person as unqualified for future office because they were involved in an insurrection and both houses are voting by a majority vote to say so and thus disqualify somebody. Um, the, uh, if they were to disqualify under, uh, under impeachment, they can disqualify from, uh, from future federal office. Yeah. There, as to the 14th Amendment Section 3, there was a, um, an interesting post recently. Uh, I don't have it handy or I'd link to it in the chat, but an interesting post recently that a friend of mine uh, made an argument that um, that President Trump actually stopped becoming president, uh, stopped being president on January 6th when he was involved in the insurrection because that provision in the 14th Amendment, Section 3, ha has automatic effect when somebody engages in an insurrection. The argument was, if a president engages in an insurrection, you don't need a congressional finding that they engaged in an insurrection or a judicial finding that they engaged in an insurrection, they immediately become an insurrectionist and immediately become unqualified for holding the very office that they're holding. Now, my own thought is that that seems like a, an interesting but dangerous position because what it would in effect mean is that we've had a, 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 an acting president Pence for the last week and he didn't even know it. Um, and that seems kind of troubling when we think about lines of succession and making sure that there actually is a person in the office of the presidency. Um, but I thought it was kind of a, a provocative idea and um, throw it out there in the hope that maybe somebody will take me up and say, hey, I want to defend that. OK. Um... So I'm kind of just going in the order that the questions are being asked. So I'm sorry if we're kind of jumping back and forth a little bit here, but is it possible or how would it be possible to disallow any of the Trump family, his children and their spouses who are official government officials from ever running for president or a government job? Good question. Um... I haven't had that. So uh, <laughs> I think what Congress would need to do is designate them as having been involved in an insurrection under the 14th Amendment, Section 3. And if Congress were to do that by a majority vote in both houses, the, the reasoning that, that I'll say what I take to be the majority reasoning among common law thinkers is that they could then designate those individuals as unqualified for holding future office. Um, that's... Uh, that that's interesting. Bold move if uh, Congress were to do that. Okay, so next one from a procedure perspective, would President Trump need the specific names of the insurrectionists to pardon them? So that's another fantastic question and another area where we have a lot of indeterminacy. We don't have judicial decisions on this, and we don't have really determinate text in the Constitution that gives us answers to these questions. And so again, we're looking to history and tradition to try to figure out what all that means. Now, we know, for example, that President Ford pardoned President, uh, former President Nixon in a kind of blanket way, right, for all, all, prior, all possible prior crimes that Nixon might have committed. And that is important. A pardon can only be for past behavior. It can't be a free get out of jail card for all future behavior. That, that much we do know. But in terms of the past behavior, 
typically we would say that a pardon has to at least name the behavior that might give rise to a later criminal charge, if not the charge itself, right? And at least name the person or class of individuals. Well, in some ways our history cuts against that. Think about President Ford's pardon. He pardoned former President Nixon for any behavior in office that might later uh, be determined a crime. That's a pretty sweeping blanket pardon. Now, a lot of folks think that that's too sweeping, too broad, um, but there you have it. Uh, President Carter pardoned um, draft, uh, draft dodgers in the Vietnam era, right? And, um, and again, a kind of blanket pardon without naming individuals, but rather naming a class of individuals. So based on past practice, there's some indication that President Trump actually could issue a kind of blanket pardon to individuals who were involved in the insurrection last week. Now, having said that, there is a way to test it, right? So suppose that President Trump were to issue a pardon like that. And then suppose that a federal prosecutor were to come along and, and one who's really been out front on this is, um, is the US Attorney for the District of Columbia to say, we're actually gonna go ahead and we're gonna prosecute these individuals or at least some of them, irrespective of the pardon that President Trump purported to, to issue. At that point, the prosecution would commence, the criminal defendant would file a motion to dismiss, right? on the basis of the pardon. And at that point, the validity of the pardon would be at issue before the courts. Was the pardon constitutional or not? And the courts would be in the position of ruling exactly the question that the questioner asked. Um, how would the courts rule in a situation like that? I gotta tell you, I, have re I really have no idea. Um, the best indication of this that we have is President Ford's sweeping pardon of former President Nixon and President Carter's pardon of um, individuals who uh, declined to comply with draft orders in the Vietnam era. Um, okay, so you had said earlier that the rioters could not be pardoned for certain crimes such as like attempt. However, what about conspiracy? Um, oh. Do you think that conspiracy could be a route towards charging more serious crimes via RICO or other federal statutes as opposed to some of what we're seeing now, like trespassing? Yeah, great question. Thank you. And it gives me a chance to clarify. I'm sorry about this, but I, I meant to make a distinction not between attempt and other inchoate or completed crimes, but rather federal crimes and state crimes. So the pardon power would extend to federal crimes, which would also include crimes in DC. And that's just because DC for constitutional purposes is a federal enclave. It operates under the authority of the federal government and criminal law in DC is actually enforced by federal authorities. So the president's pardon power would extend to feder any federal crimes and to, um, and to uh, DC crimes, but it would not extend to any inchoate crimes like attempt or solicitation or you know, any other inchoate crimes that were committed in the states in the run up to the insurrection. And so you know, as we're watching the news, more and more evidence is coming out that the insurrectionists were actually planning this sometime in advance the insurrection, in, in advance of the insurrection in their individual states. Now, if, if state and local prosecutors can determine that that was criminal activity, even if in inchoate in criminal activity, um, they can certainly prosecute them, even if President Trump can pardon them for the federal crimes. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Yes. I'm, can I, can, I it, just in the spirit of, um, uh, expanding the people who are talking. <laughs> Let me ask, um, can I put a question back to everybody and see if anybody is interested in, in, um, in answering this? What do you think? Should criminal charges be brought against the folks who, who, um, who attacked the Capitol last week? An Anthony, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, I think that if they're, 
If the use of the criminal law is not to prevent people from attacking the very heart of lawmaking, then I don't know what it's for, flatly. I think that this was an attack on the actual democratic process and a legitimately planned attempt to seize members of Congress for the purposes of overthrowing an election. That's insurrection. That's that's an attempt to overthrow the will of everyone who participated in the election. And I think that that demands some sort of response from the criminal law. Let me let me ask back for Anthony or anybody else who wants to weigh in. Many of what we've heard from the insurrectionists and other um, Trump supporters in recent weeks is that the election was flawed um, and that the election results that were certified in the states are uh, are flawed and false and that President Trump actually won the election and that um, the states and the Electoral College have stolen the election from him. Uh, is If that's somebody's belief, does it, does it change your answer? If we do not commit ourselves to an objective sense of reality, if we lose that concept now, then the next wave that comes, the next charming demagogue will succeed. And we will have to live with the consequences of that. Anthony, I'm, sm I, I'm smiling. I hope, I hope you don't take that as me minimizing your very serious comments, but I noticed that Laura Darby dropped in the group chat. I heard he won in all 50 states. And how can that not make you smile, right? So that <laughs> that's what I saw. Point well taken. Anybody else want to weigh in on, on uh, criminal liability for the insurrectionists? Rachel. Hi, yeah. I think if you don't take criminal action against insurrectionists, there really wouldn't be any any dissuading future insurrectionists. And I think that that would be a big problem just from a purely criminal standpoint. Okay, sure. And we know from criminal law that there are different purposes of criminal law, right? And specific deterrence and general deterrence are two of those purposes. And so I, what I'm hearing you say is that prosecuting individuals would serve a deterrent function that uh, it is, a, is a really important one under the circumstances. We don't want people taking to the Capitol when they're not happy with the election outcomes. Courtney? Yes, hi. So I think as far as criminal sanctions, even if they believed that, you know, this election was being stolen from them, which I honestly do think that's what they thought, um, what concerns me were some of the people showing up with like zip ties, um, the bombs that were found outside. Um, there needs to be a serious investigation as to what the motives were behind that. Because even if you disagree with the elections, we cannot let people get away with possibly trying to kidnap and kill people in Congress. Courtney, I'm interested in your thoughts or anybody else who wants to weigh in um, on the point that you just raised. And, uh, you know, one thing that strikes me about the politics recently is that we have seen um, a lot of threatened potential and actual violence by Trump supporters in ways that we just aren't really accustomed to in our democracy, at least in the recent history of our country. I'm thinking about the, the, uh, the threats against Governor Whitmer in Michigan, for example. Um, reactions to that generally. What, are, how, how concerned are we? Because one, I, I'll just tell you for myself, as a political community, I don't think we're concerned enough about that. Those things worry me very deeply. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering if other people share, share that view. Alexandra? <laughs> I totally agree with that. I think that um, uh, liberals or the Democratic Party, we uh, even as we're watching all of this unfold in the Capitol, everybody's still trying to sing Kumbaya. And I don't think that they're the 
reaction was swift enough. Um, I don't think uh, that the response was as forceful or as I would have would expect it to be in under the circumstances. Yeah, and uh, you know, just Alexandra, that I, I I appreciate your comment. And just adding to that, Aaron added in the group chat: Is it that we haven't seen threats like this, or that we haven't seen them on this scale? And Aaron, I want to riff on that point for a second. You know, one of the things that other stri that also strikes me about the conversations that we're having is that, um, you know, if you pay careful attention to the way some of this is discussed in the media, I think you you pick up on this a little bit. But I'm, I'm I guess I'm I'm personally a little surprised and disappointed that we're not talking more about the racial aspect of this. Um, the reason that ties back to Aaron's point is that, you know, we have seen electoral violence against people of color in our recent history uh, for the purpose of disenfranchising them. And, uh, and we don't talk about that a lot. And when we do, we tend to sweep it under the, the rug. Um, given what happened uh, last week, I, I guess I, you know, what concerns me in hearing the public discourse is that we're not, we're not talking enough about race. Um, and I, I throw that out there and ask if anybody's interested in talking about that. Stephanie, I see your hand is up. Yeah, so I think that when we all saw that picture of the noose hanging in front of the Capitol building, um, people want to think that that's not America. And we've had certainly a number of politicians and other people feeding this rhetoric that this isn't us and we shouldn't be acting like this. When in reality, I think that the first step is accepting that this is us. This is who we always have been. And this is who we are continuing to be. And not recognizing that is the first problem is that if we don't recognize our failures in the past and continuing, we're never going to be able to fix them. And that includes racial issues that have been going ongoing. Yeah, and I, I feel like not only, you know, not only are we not addressing them, we're not, we're not even agreeing on what those problems are, right, at a very fundamental level that I it's just so much talking past each other in today's politics that I worry about our ability to come together on uh, identifying and naming problems, much less solutions. I know that um, a couple of folks had posted follow-up issues in chat. I'm trying to follow, to follow those as we go, but in order to keep the conversation going, um, Benjamin, you've got your hand up. You're a new voice. Let's hear from you. Yeah, I, I think with the racial component, we can't ignore that it wasn't clear through most of that which side law enforcement was on. Um, it's something I've worked in and I think it's very concerning how many white supremacist groups have infiltrated and are inside a lot of our law enforcement. Like you watch that attack and they let them in. And so there's, a, there's definitely a, some, a big concern beyond this is where is law enforcement in this and why was there such a disparate such a different response to this in the protest we saw during the summer right which is another another racial dimension to uh to this problem on several different levels right i'm hearing you raise a couple of different issues where race overlays with the problems that we saw, uh, not just last week, but also over the, the summer. Um, yeah, and it'll be interesting, I think, to see uh, how prosecutors react to, uh, to more and more discoveries of um, law enforcement and uh, members affiliated with the military involved in the insurrection last week. What do prosecutors do with that? Uh, what does the president do with it in terms of exercising his pardon power uh, can be very telling, I think, about uh, where, you know, where we're going to go with, uh, with those issues. Um, Alexandra? Yeah, just kind of going off of what Benjamin said, the, the restraint that was shown uh, last week 
is the kind of restraint that we've been screaming at police to use for years. Um, I personally believe that had it been uh, Black Lives Matter protesters um, who had who did what those people did, they would have been shot um, without hesitation. And um, you know, another thing is the National Guard wasn't uh, wasn't up to the task um, at the time. And you know, as to Benjamin's point, they have infiltrated uh, police departments. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw the, there was a official for the New York Police Department who uh, recently re retired. Uh, he was facing suspension without, or without pay um, for posting anti-Semitic, misogynist, uh, racist comments in a police board anonymously. Um, and he was formerly the head of workplace discrimination unit for the, the department. So um, I think police departments are going to have to purge um, across this country, they're going to have to really uh, hone down who, who, who's really in this, um, who can do this job fairly, and um, I think that's going to be a difficult task. And that's, but that's something I think we definitely have to address. I, I love the way you you pose that, Alexandra, and it raises all kinds of issues in in my head. But but one of the questions that it raises, and I, I know there are hands, but I, I, I'm intensely curious about this. What do we do in a democracy about the fox in the hen house problem, right? What do we do when those who are charged with enforcing the law are, are so, some of whom, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, some of whom are in charge with enforcing the law are the ones who are undermining it or actively not enforcing it? And there's a, a question in the group chat that touches on this that I, I just want to I, I want to address very quickly and then get your reaction to to what I just asked. Um, Bill asked everybody, can you please comment on OLC's guidance on not seeking to indict a sitting president? What legal basis is there for that policy? Can AG Garland change that? What would be uh, the barriers? to changing that. So the Office of Legal Counsel, if you don't know, is an office that sort of sits deep in the bowels of the Justice Department on Pennsylvania Avenue and provides legal advice to the executive branch on constitutional issues, but statutory issues as well. Advice that the executive branch is unlikely to get from the courts just because so many of these issues are non-justiciable in the way that I talked about non-justiciability earlier. And so OLC is sometimes considered the Supreme Court of the executive branch because its opinions carry that kind of weight. And as Bill correctly said, OLC has long had guidance that says a sitting president cannot be indicted and, uh, and charged under uh, federal criminal law. Now, just a couple of things on that. So first off, explaining the OLC's reasoning in that memo and that opinion. What OLC says is, look, the president occupies an, a special place in our constitutional structure. The president is the only person who alone is sitting atop a branch of government, right? The courts have many judges, Congress has many Congress members. The president alone sits atop the executive branch. And moreover, the president is responsible for what goes on in the executive branch. A key part of what goes on in the executive branch is enforcing criminal law. And so the president has and ought to have some say so, the reasoning goes, with regard to enforcement of criminal law. Now that's problematic for, or not necessarily problematic, but raises all kinds of interesting separation of powers issues that we could talk about. We do have a history of independent prosecutions in this country and, in, and an independent Justice Department. But nevertheless, the theory is that the president has some say so with regard to when, how, and why laws are enforced in this country. And moreover, if a president is subject to criminal indictment, that means that we're taking out that one person who sits atop that one branch and it as it turns out to be a pretty important branch, right? Essentially taking them out of office. And functionally what that could mean is that a rogue prosecutor could take down a president, right? 
And so OLC says that can't possibly be right in our constitutional tradition that, you know, you've got, you can't have a, a rogue prosecutor who answers to the president being able to take out the president in that way. Now, that's not uncontroversial. A lot of us believe that's flatly wrong, that that kind of opinion puts the president functionally above the law. Um, what the opinion doesn't say is that the president can't be indicted after the president leaves office. So, so that's still possible and available and a way to hold the president to account. It also doesn't say anything about state prosecution. And if you were following the Supreme Court this past year, you know that the Supreme Court rejected President Trump's flat claim that the president enjoys absolute immunity from all state criminal processes. Now, the Supreme Court did not say that the president could be charged with a state crime while sitting as president. It didn't say that. But it did reject the president's broader separation of powers claim that the president enjoys absolute immunity. So I give you this legal background to, uh, to you know, sort of reopen my question. What do you all think about the fox and the hen house problem? Are we, have we struck the right balance in our democracy in terms of policing the folks that we expect to police us? Anthony, your hand is up. Yeah, um, I think the answer is, is clearly no. Um, the United States has a deep problem with its policing, a deep and historically rooted problem. In many jurisdictions, um, I don't know if DC is one of them, it was common policy for, I think, at least 10 years for cops to wear Klan robes while on duty. And the symbol of the KKK was the symbol of state authority. And the FBI about 10 years ago had to change their interaction guidelines when investigating um, far right extremism because local law enforcement were deeply inundated with far right extremists. This country has to figure out how to reckon with that. Any ideas? Um, Benjamin, you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. It, this is some, this is something I I struggle with a lot. Um, uh, the field I'm this is a field I'm in, um, and it, a lot of it it starts with warrior culture. I mean, if if you look at a lot of if you walk, if you walk into any cop's office, you'll see that stupid quote from the uh, Harvard professor who said that's uh, we are the wolves guarding the sheep. And that is, that's really a lot of the problem that you're going to see with trying to break that culture is it's, it's become so obsessed with their being warriors, not servants to the community. And I think that's really a lot of the racism and the reason why people don't, people who aren't racist within police departments don't root out racism is because they see themselves as that warrior culture where you don't attack someone inside the group. Nobody's in the in-group and they won't make those fixes. So I think it's got to start with psychologically changing what is the role of law enforcement in our society. Are they warriors going out and hunting criminals or are they servants to society? And until we start having them see that, I don't think we're going to be able to change it by prosecuting a couple cops. Thank you. Um, Michael, your hand is up. Let's hear from you. Yes, uh, go, uh, piggybacking off what Benjamin said, I, I, I agree with that. And uh, I think the role of the police that I do know uh, many, many do adhere to is uh, the role of the guardian, the guardian of civilization, not uh, the warrior, but the servant, the guardian who keeps um, who's a servant to the community and keeps the community safe and and protects their rights because ultimately at the end of the day when this, things like this happen the insurrections happen who who is the arm of government that's going to protect the rule of law it's going to come down to police with the right mindset that are upholding the oaths they're sworn to protect Thank you. Um, all very thoughtful comments. I really appreciate that. 
as you're talking, um, and Zara, I see your hand up. Um, I, I want to interject just for a second and tie this back to a theme that we talked about over the summer and into the fall. And I did a, a session like this on police accountability in the Black Lives Matter context. Um, there are some impediments in our constitutional system to holding police to account and holding other government officials to account as well. Um, qualified immunity is one that we, that we know about, limitations on Bivens actions, immunities and limitations on Section 1983 civil rights actions, um, even things like the Iqbal and Twombly pleading standards that you might have learned about in civil procedure. These can all operate, and others can operate as impediments to holding um, officers, both uniformed officers and uh, civilian officials in the government, to account for constitutional violations. Um, and uh, again, I think you know, coming out of those discussions over the summer, um, my sense was that a, a number of us felt like we have simply not found the right balance in holding individual officers and officials to account. Um, Zara, as I was uh, kind of blabbing on, I noticed your hand went down. I hope we didn't lose you. Or can, would you like to contribute? Um, yeah, I, don't, I didn't do that, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, OK, um, sorry. <laughs> no, you're OK. Um, I was actually just going to say, like, because I, I mean, I would say just generally, like, I have kind of a, I would say I have a unique perspective on the whole, like, policing standpoint, because I um, work as, well, I've worked as for the past year, I've been basically um, like a social worker who responds to mental health calls with the police um, in my hometown. And a lot of what's going on, I feel like is there's just like, there's so many issues. And it's, I feel like the whole, the general like theme of hate towards the police definitely isn't helping. It's understood, but like the whole culture of everybody jumping in on, you know, like the police or this and that. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand how much they are just essentially like used as political pawns. Like it's really just, it's so unfair. And like, so for the ones who, you know, are terrible and makes everybody else look bad, but they're just, it's really disgusting to me how used they are. It's like, you know, the politicians will stand up there. Um, I like Lightfoot, so I'll use her as an example. So she, you know, she generally has a distaste for the police and she makes it known. However, you know, this recent, scandal where the police raided the wrong home she was in on helping them hide tapes for that and so now she's coming back out to say well they shouldn't have done it but she's the one who is in charge of it all and then people are overlooking that and saying oh again it's a police problem but back to my role so i'm a social worker in my hometown and so i only respond to mental health calls with the police department and a huge issue we have is I worked with officers that are all different. So some of them are, you know, insensitive. They're like, get me out of here. This is not my job, which, they, you know, not the attitude to have, so it's pretty bad, but they're not wrong. It's not their job. And I think that's a huge issue going on right now too, is like, you know, a lot of people don't want police responding to certain things. And the thing is, they don't want to be responding to them either, but there are no resources. So it comes back to the governments like at a local and state level making those resources because even when I show up to something, if so, I only go if it's suicidal or homicidal, that's when we're called in. So the only actions that we can take are we can, um, if the person is suicidal, we assess it. And um, if they're of imminent harm to themselves or others, then we have to force them to go to a mental health facility, facility up in Winnebago, um, or they can voluntarily choose to go to one. But it's, it's literally one of those two options. If they're struggling with their mental health and they just want help, then it's awful because all we can do is sit there and say, well, I can offer you, you know, here's, some phone numbers you can call, but I have nothing for you. And the police, for the most part that I work with are equally, if not more, like just as frustrated. 
with that because it's like they're going to stuff and they're like, well, I don't know what to do kind of thing, you know? So. They're, called, they're called upon to do things that they don't have training or resources to, to actually do is what I'm hearing you say. And yeah. Yeah. Um, um, uh, sorry, I was just gonna say also a lot of them that I've spoken with too, like I've had a lot of great discussions and they tell me that they want the training, they wish they had it, but that's just another resource that's unavailable to them. Wow, sobering. And sorry, you've got a, a tough job. We all owe, owe you a debt of gratitude for doing the job that you do. Thank you. Um, I like I it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, more power to you. We're glad that you're doing it. Thank you. It's, um, I, I think that's an important perspective to have uh, as well. And we know, you know, hearing news reports and looking at video from what happened last week, um, we, we know that there were heroes. Uh, among the officers, the uniformed officers who were on site, that people people took heroic action in a variety of different ways. And uh, so I think it, it, it is important not to paint with too broad a brush. Um, I wonder if we can expand the theme a little bit, though, and talk um, not only about officers, but holding officials to account in a democracy. It seems to me that over the last couple of months, maybe even over the last couple of years, we have um, we've been challenged with how to hold officials to account uh, for their behavior in a variety of different ways. We're talking about police behavior, but you know when we think about impeachment, we're talking about holding the president to account for behavior. When we talk about um, Trump supporters, even you know lodging legal claims or putting up a competing slate of electors in a state, challenging a state election. They're challenging legal authority. And I guess what I'm wondering from you all is what, um, what are, have, are we at the right place in our democracy in our ability to hold leaders to account? Or are there structural changes that we need to think about or make or political changes that we need to think about or make to, um, to increase uh, accountability and allow us to hold folks to account better. Um, Anthony, I see your hand is up. I think the part of the difficulty that we have with law enforcement comes from the fact that the role of the state has retreated over the last 60 years into a smaller and smaller interaction with most people's lives to the point where law enforcement is one of the only civil services available. I think we really want people to believe in the rule of law again, and they want to believe in the project of the state and the common wheel. We need to provide people with connections to civil government and things that will make people feel like there is a shared project. I, I love the way you said that, Anthony, and I'm really glad you raised the point that is precisely my objective in today's session, um, that I hope we can start a larger conversations about these issues, because I, I truly believe that it's in these conversations that we start, not finish, but start to make change happen. Um, a wonderful question came in privately about whether, whether we think um, Organizations like bar associations are going to hold some of these actors to account, um, in particular Josh Hawley or <coughs> we've already heard some murmurings from New York Bar Association holding uh, Rudy Giuliani to account for, for his behavior. Um, are we gonna start to see that? Or we've, we've heard in some of the lawsuits threats of rule 11 sanctions by courts. Um, Yes, I do. And, and I think that's perfectly appropriate. If you recall, um, in the wake of the Clinton impeachment, President Clinton was disbarred. Um, I think it, it, it makes sense as a lawyer, a member of the bar myself, uh, I would hope that bar associations would look seriously at some of the behavior that we've seen um, through the election and uh, into the insurrection. So yes, I do think that some of those organizations will, 
are, are you know, will provide some accountability as well. Um, I, I also think that, you know, we're starting to see in the news that um, other organizations are uh, using their own leverage under our constitutional system to hold officials to account. Major corporations declining to fund uh, politicians who voted against certifying Biden as the elector, for example, um, seems to be gaining some significant traction. Uh, the word on the street is that um, White House staff members are going to have a real hard time getting a job when they get out, um, based on some of the um, some of the uh, some of their behavior. And so, I think there are different forms of accountability as well. Um, Zara, your hand is up. I actually just, um, to, I think, Anthony, you made a really good point. I liked what you said. Um, and to go off of that as well, I think another issue with policing that a lot of people don't talk about is how they are, the, the main, I mean, yes, they're supposed to stop crime and whatnot, but the main point really is to serve your community and in order to do that, you have to have a good relationship with your community. So uh, I think a huge thing to work on is repairing those relationships. And, you know, it comes through different things, just like, you know, officers being friendly. And it's, it's hard in this day and age, especially now with COVID, obviously, nobody's going outside their house. They can't connect with anybody. A lot of like in-person events and stuff like that have been canceled, like shop with a cop, whatnot. Um, so that's a really good point you made. And then um, what you said, Professor Schwinn, about um, holding people accountable, I always think about that. I think about that a lot because it's weird how we live in such an informational age where everything, you know, spreads so quickly and like we see stuff on the news and Twitter almost instantly. And to me, it always seems like it's like I see something happen. And then it's like, oh, well, I don't like that person for that. And then it's like, well, what's going to come of it, you know, because I don't really know how people would be removed from their position or disciplined. Um, like, obviously, I just learned about the model rules and whatnot. So I know about sanctions for lawyers, but I don't really know. I just kind of feel like the only course now that I would think of is that something negative happens. Uh, the news about their reputation is spread and then like all we can do is kind of hold our breath for the next voting period or whatever and wait for people to remember that or whatever they did and then vote based on that that's all i know of yeah and sorry so um you know leaving leaving accountability to ordinary politics i think is uh is sort of a stock answer that I have when we talk about these things in um, in a constitutional law class, for example, right? If you don't, if a, if an issue is not justiciable, what's the remedy? Well, the ballot box is the remedy, or free speech is the remedy, um, and that's all well and good. But I think you know we also recognize and if, maybe have to recognize that those are imperfect vehicles for holding people to account as well. Um, and I had mentioned, for example, uh, corporate funding of individuals who had um, declined to uh, certify, uh, to vote for the certification of, of President-elect Biden. Um, I think that's sig significant, but it wasn't really all that long ago that the Supreme Court ruled in Citizens United, but basically between that and a companion DC circuit ruling, opened the floodgate for all kinds of corporate expenditure in our politics, and since then, the price of getting a seat in Congress has just skyrocketed. Uh, the spending that we saw in the runoff in Georgia, for example, is astonishing. I mean, this is pricing people out of politics and it's, it's distorting the political marketplace. And I think we see similar distortions in the marketplace for free speech. And so I worry about whether those can be effective, um, uh, effective checks and uh, mechanisms for accountability. What do other folks think? How do we how do we ensure accountability um, given the problems that we've seen? Are, are we doing it the right way? Are there other ways that we ought to be doing it? Either for President Trump or for any other officials?
so we I talked a little bit about what I see as kind of a fox in the hen house problem. Um, when there, when we have a sitting president who is uh, unable or unwilling to enforce the law against himself or his administration or people in his orbit, there's a real problem in our separation of powers system. And the problem is that the president sits atop the executive branch, which is responsible for executing the law. If the Department of Justice declines to execute the law, um, on orders from the president, for example, nobody's going to execute the law, right? And, um, and that seems deeply problematic. I mentioned that we do have a tradition in our history of independence of the Justice Department from the White House, but that's just a tradition. There's nothing in law that makes the Attorney General or the FBI Director or the OLC head or anybody else in DOJ independent from the president. Um, is there a way to solve that particular problem? It's a problem that we faced in the Nixon administration as well, and a problem that we faced in other administrations from time to time since then. But I think it's an acute problem in the Trump administration. Are there, are there things that we can do about this? Michael. I don't know what the answer is, but I, I'm just wondering, is the Department of Justice, is it theoretically possible to go to another branch or be overseen by a couple branches so that there would be not direct oversight by the head of the executive? Yeah, um, I think that's an intriguing idea. The um, So it's kind of, kind of interesting, one of the phenomenon, the phenomena that we're seeing in separation of powers over the last 30 years or so is um, what many refer to as the unitary executive. The theory that because the president is the only person who sits atop the executive branch, the president ought to have ultimate responsibility for everything that occurs within the executive branch. That's a pretty breathtaking idea if you think about the the uh, the potential ramifications of it. Um, here's a here's a, a an example when um, it, during hurricane season when President Trump was trying to illustrate the path of a hurricane, he obviously took out a sharpie and expanded the path of the hurricane as determined by the scientists in NOAA. Now. A unitary executive would say that the president has all the power to do that, right? Or when the White House undermines uh, science coming out of the Environmental Protection Agency or the CDC, some would say, well, the president has absolute authority to do that because the president sits atop the executive branch and the accountability is at the ballot box. If you don't like it, vote the president out. But the problem is that those agencies control so much of our information and law enforcement that it's really hard to know any different um, if the president is monkeying around with their business. And so, you know, how do you hold a president accountable? What you're suggesting is having a different kind of agency that might provide accountability. But the trend line in thinking about the unitary executive is that in our tripartite system of government, it's actually impossible to have that kind of entity. Let me give you something to compare that to, to see what the problem is in our system. In uh, South Africa, which is a much more recent constitution, it came out in 1996, it has a number of independent agencies that are hardwired into the constitution with different political lines of accountability that are designed to exactly meet the problem that we're talking about. And so for example, there's an office of public protector that has authority to, um, that has authority to investigate wrongdoing within the executive branch of the South African government. And it answers independently to parliament. It doesn't answer to the executive. We can't design an agency like that under our current tripartite structure and under current Supreme Court ruling. Now, I think 
the Constitution allows us to design an agency like that, but the trend line at the Supreme Court has been exactly against that. And so, um, you know, one of the things that might come out of this conversation is to rethink uh, what's going on at the Supreme Court with regard to the unitary executive theory and separation of powers and trying to make arguments under Article I, Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause, that Congress has authority to create this kind of independence and do exactly, Michael, what you're suggesting, um, which I believe Congress does have authority to do. But here's the thing, and as we're coming close to, to time, I don't want to get all preachy on you or anything, but you know, we're studying to be advocates, or, or many of us are advocates um, in one way or another, right? And conversations like this, I think, can provide ideas and discussion. We learn from each other. Our ideas develop and grow. Hopefully what we do after a conversation like this is figure out something to do with them. And so, for example, Michael, the idea that you just came up with, why can't we have some kind of independent agency that sits outside of the executive branch that could hold executive branch officials accountable in some sort of new, different, and creative way? Well, maybe we can. But in order to do that, we have to understand you know, kind of where we are with our jurisprudence on separation of powers and how to move beyond that, right? How do we engineer cases at the Supreme Court to move beyond that? How do we engineer social movements to push against the unitary executive theory? How do we write in scholarship to get the word out that the unitary executive theory is incomplete or wrong or misguided? Um, how do we litigate cases in our own legal practice to that end, right? How do we support nonprofits and other instigators? Um, so if, if ideas are coming out of this conversation, I hope that they're not just ideas coming out of a conversation, but that we all take to the streets and do something. Because after all, this is our democracy and this is the way change happens. Um, a question came in, let me see here. So uh, just a couple of questions. If Trump tries to self-pardon, would he need to list the specific crimes, assuming that it's determined he can't self-pardon, would prosecutors be able to use his attempt to self-pardon as an admission of guilt? Great question. So just as to the latter, would it be a formal admission of guilt? N no, um, but it would, I mean, a pardon usually means that you've done something that is criminal. <laughs> and so as a practical matter, it suggests that he would understand that he's done something that could be prosecuted. Um, would he need to list the specific crimes? Probably not, given the, the, the history that we talked about earlier in the chat um, with President Ford and President Carter. Um, we do have a history of a blanket pardon that's not uncontroversial, but if he could self-pardon, a blanket pardon would not be entirely novel. Um, what are the remedies or fail-safes if another insurrection somehow successfully prohibits or obstructs the peaceful transition of power? Has this been thought through? You know, I, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of time, and I think that's a sobering and fantastic and relevant way to, to maybe end this discussion. Um, what I'm hearing uh, is that the Defense Department, uh, National Guard units, police departments around the country are preparing for this, not only in Washington, but also at 50 state capitals in the next, in the next week or so. And, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that those folks are doing their jobs. We're seeing more and more indication from top Pentagon officials and top military leadership uh, sending a signal to members of our military that their job is to follow the Constitution um, and not follow individuals uh, say so that violates the Constitution. And, and that all is encouraging to me. Um, you know, what, <laughs> what happens, I think, is, is anybody's guess at this point. Um, I've, I've stopped guessing what might come about in the Trump administration. Um, but, but yeah, we're, we're hoping that some things will happen. We're also hearing from prosecutors that they're looking to insurrection as a crime, as a criminal charge for some of the folks that stormed the Capitol last week, which I think is encouraging because it underscores the seriousness of those crimes. So it's not, 
you know, it's not property damage at the Capitol, which is bad enough, right? But it's actual insurrection against the United States government. When you're charged with that kind of thing, it's kind of a big deal and it brings it to a different level. So I do hope that we'll see more prosecutions like that and, um, you know, prosecutors sending a message that we take this kind of thing very, very seriously. It's not something to normalize. Are there any are there any closing thoughts that anybody wants to share with us? Professor? Yes, ma'am, Mary uh, thank you. so good to see you. It's good to see you too, sir. Um, speaking it as a person who has never studied the law and, and struggles with trying to understand this and why people aren't just, you know, thrown in jail already. Um, I sincerely appreciate your thoughts on, on this subject and, and everything. Um, and I love to hear from our students to see how, to see how they're um, learning. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thank you for that comment. I, I share that. I just, uh, I so cherish this opportunity to hear um, from our, our students who I know are thinking about these problems and cherish the opportunity to spend this time with everybody on the call and, uh, and think through some of these problems. So I do, I, I do want to thank you. I hope that we'll be able to do more sessions like this that are more interactive thinking about um, you know, not what the law is, but what the law ought to be, not what our constitution is, but what it ought to be, not how we actually hold people to account, but how we might hold people to account in a democracy and thinking in that way in the spirit of making change. Um, I know we didn't get a lot to a number of questions that I'm seeing individually and in the group chat box. Uh, if we didn't get to yours and you'd like to follow up with me on email, please, please send me an email. I, I, I really would appreciate hearing from you. And, uh, and we'll respond. And, um, and again, look out, we'll do more of these sessions. It's, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure and treat and honor. Thank you to everybody, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.